kind of when I was really pretty new at comedy. I was going home. I may have been doing it one or two years. I was going home to Sacramento where I grew up, California, and I was going to do comedy. I was doing the show at like a coffee shop, uh, seated maybe 50 people, and my parents were going to come. Luna's Cafe. Exactly, Luna's Cafe. <laughs> hey, man, you know everything. <laughs> and so I go there, and they decide, they realize, it's like a showcase with maybe six or seven comedians, mm. but they realize that all the crowd is there to see me because I'm, I don't live there. Those, those local comedians are up every week, and yeah. so you know, it's hard to get people out. But I brought like 40 people or something. <laughs> and so the guy says to me, he goes, hey, we're just going to put you on last because we're afraid if we put you on earlier, your people might leave. Yeah, we don't yeah. want them to leave. They were holding each other in. So I said, sure, that's fine. And so um, my mom comes. She had been on a flight that got delayed uh, coming in, flying into town. And because it got delayed, I think they offered on the plane, like, free free booze. Oh. So, so my mom starts drinking on this plane <laughs> and then uh, lands right at showtime. Her friend picks her up. They come straight to the show. She's coming in hot. She gets there. And pretty soon after the show starts, I get word in the green room that uh, the, one of the, the hosts comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, just to let you know, uh, your mom's kind of heckling a lot of comedians. <laughs> and he's like, it's not bad. You know, she's not, not in a bad way, but she just thinks like she's trying to help them. You know, she's trying to like add to their jokes <laughs> and no one really wants to say anything to her because it's your mom. And so they don't want to be mean. And I was like, just go ahead. Do whatever you need to do. He goes, oh, okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> won't be mean to her, but I might have to tell her just to keep it down. You yeah. Know? And, dude, go for it. Don't worry about it. Because I have this family that, like, want – it's the center of attention as a family, you know. Like, they're only happy – their only critique of my comedy is that I don't make fun of them more in my comedy. Because <laughs> they just get it like any press is good press. They just want to be involved, you know. And so – my mom's heckling everybody, and the host keeps telling her, like, listen, you gotta, you, Mr. Sparks, you gotta quiet it down, you gotta stop, blah, blah, blah. And so, um, so then I go on stage, and uh, she says something to me. I think I was up there, and I was like, so yeah, I was in Walmart. I was, I was walking through Walmart the other day, and she's just yelling out, like, random. She just goes, like, oh, Walmart's a great store. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, like, it's not like, that doesn't add to my joke at all. It's not even, like, an extra punchline. That was a setup. And she just jumps in in the middle of this premise. Kind of stops me, and I'm like, yeah, okay, Mom, great. And then I keep going, and I was like, so, anyway, I'm telling this idea, I'm this joke. I'm like, so, anyway, guys, I live in China, and, and my mom goes, and we miss you. <laughs> like, you know? It's not what you want to hear. I'm like two years into comedy. I'm nervous. I'm not really that confident on stage. I'm more nervous because I'm new. And you know, you want to look cool. Now your mom's shouting out. She misses you, you know. And uh, so I was like, Mom, I, I stopped the show. And I'm like, Mom, I've never said this before to anybody, but especially to you. But I've never said this before to you, but you got to shut your mouth. Uh. <laughs> and so she does. She gets quiet. She's quiet for the whole show. And I can't see her because there's like these lights in my face. I can't see her. So then the show ends. I'm on last. Yay, we're done. I see her coming up to me, awake, working her way up to me. And I kind of remembered, the, oh, yeah, I just told my mom to shut up and in front of all of her friends, in front of all these people, her friends. So she comes up to me, and I'm thinking she's going to be like crying, yeah. and upset, or like yeah. yelling and mad uh -huh. and embarrassed. She comes up to me, and she goes like, turn. It was like worse. It's worse than she comes up to me. She goes, Turner, that thing you did to me up there? We make a great comedy duo. <laughs> I'm like, what? No! She's like, we should go on the road. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Hello and welcome to Meet the Entertainers. This is uh, Big Ben, and today we're talking to Turner Sparks, fantastic stand up comedian who helped set up the growing stand-up comedy scene in Asia and he uh, was and is very very good at it I remember taking my comedy DVD around to bars in Hong Kong and expecting them to hire me in my show and while the owners uh, liked my DVD they certainly weren't going to fork out thousands of Hong Kong dollars to book me Turner Sparks had a much much uh, better method and I'm always looking for more people to contact me so uh, do drop me an email at ben at the Big Ben Show and I don't make too much money out of the podcast, so I appreciate everyone 
who subscribes or shares this podcast or who writes a review on iTunes or on Podomatic. It all really, really helps. All right, let's go and talk to Turner. Sparks. Hold on. Does that... It sounds... It sounds like an ice cream van. Ice cream! Ice cream! Tell me about Mr. Softy ice cream trucks in China. What on earth is that? <laughs> yes! That was my business um, for 10 years. Um, I was doing that. So you guys have Mr. Whippy in England? Yes, right? yeah. Well, you also have Mr. Softy. I've heard of Mr. Softy. Yeah, so if anyone doesn't yeah. know, that's, that's a very famous ice cream. Yeah, it's an ice cream truck. It drives around the neighborhood, plays music, sells ice cream. So my friend from college, um, his grandfather started Mr. Softy in the 1950s in the United States. Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> when I moved to China just to teach English, I was just going to teach English for a year and then move home and, you know, that whole thing. Um, Same thing for me. I went to Singapore to teach English for a year and then move home. Never, le- really? never, left, to, never left Asia, yeah. And you're still there, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you got married, right? Yeah. So did you? Yeah, I did. yeah, yeah. But I remember your wife Singaporean. I remember from the joke. There you go. Um, so, I after about a year, I was talking with my friend, and um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to move back to the United States or not. But we talked about kind of different things, and we came up with the idea of trying out doing his family's Mr. Softy ice cream truck, building a truck and doing one in China, and just seeing what happened. What would happen? Wow. And so we did that. We got one and hired a couple people, opened a small business, and the first truck went great. Yeah. Uh, and we got, I mean, it, it took a year of ramp up time. I went all around China sourcing all the materials, getting the truck built. God. We had to find cone manufacturers, ice cream, where to get the ice cream, where to get all the toppings, everything. The, the spoons, the cups, the lids, the bowls, you know. This is amazing. So you're, you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, you would say, you could say that. <laughs> You're an entrepreneur for the new China. Yeah, so um, and it's a classic story. I'll, I'll tell you how what ends up happening. So then um, we built one truck. It went well, and uh, we ramped up. We eventually got to ten trucks in the Suzhou area where I was living, and a couple stores, and um, then. Uh, copy trucks started showing up, copycat trucks. Oh, this yeah. is China, typical China. Yeah. Exactly. So this is China. And then eventually we found out that those trucks were being funded by members of the local government. Oh. The China, the Suzhou, whatever, government. Yeah. And um, there was these really, there's these permits that they gave to us. That the, the ice cream truck idea, or like the mobile vending business, had not happened yeah. really in our area, most of China. And so um, we were kind of creating, when we created the business, they had to come up with these permits to give us, yes. which they hadn't had before. The designer specifically for us, and um, it was really hard to get, but if you remember the government, obviously that's uh. how you get and then eventually what they did is um, they took our per- our permits away. Oh, no. So they cleared the path for only them to do our business. And then uh, that, that made us illegal. And then so that's why, I mean, that was over a course of 10 years. We did, you know, at the end of 10 years, that's what happened. And yeah. that's when we decided to do business and I moved back to the U.S. And now I'm writing a book about that whole That's amazing. Uh, the whole experience, the up and the down and everything. God, that is unbelievable. What a story. Yeah, that's so- kind of nuts. And then I actually have another with the because um, in Hong Kong you have um, they call it mobile softy. Mm. You know those trucks? No, I don't. And, I'm learning so much. But you haven't seen them? Oh, they're at like uh, Star Ferry um, on the Kowloon side. I think I have seen them. Yes, I think yeah, I have seen it. Yeah. Ice cream truck. So there's maybe like 15 of those around Hong Kong. Mm. So those actually used to be Mr. Softy trucks, and they was legitimate because my. Um, friend's uh, grandfather, the guy who started Mr. Softy in the 50s, yeah. at some point sold off the UK, the UK, yeah. to some guy in England in like the 70s. He turned around and sold Hong Kong to some guy in Hong Kong. Oh. And then so they were running legitimate Mr. Softy trucks in Hong Kong, and then they just kept it as Mr. Softy. When I, in 2004, I opened my business, I think, or no, sorry, 2007, and then I think around... Around that time, 2007, 2008, 
I knew they were down there. So I went down there just to say hi, to be like, hey, I'm in the, I'm in the region. Maybe we can group together on purchasing or something, mm-hmm. you know? There's some way to cooperate. I think they took it as, uh, or I did find out later, that they took it as, they thought I was being sent by Mr. Softy in America. Yeah. As kind of like an intimidation thing to make them stop using the name. Oh. Mr. Softy, because technically Hong Kong had gone back. It wasn't part of the UK anymore, you know? Mm. Uh, that ended up not being true, but uh, anyway, so then they had to change, they changed the name to Mobile Softy. Yeah. Because they, that's what I was trying to make them do, but. You went. <laughs> I, no, I didn't care at all. I was just there, uh, you know, meet him. But anyway, yeah. So that was the business. And how did um, how did you start doing um, comedy? Tell me about the drunken clam and Sean. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You've done the research. Um, so I started in 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend Sean, uh, this guy from California. We're both from California. He opened a bar, the Drunken Clam at Suzhou, which is named after like the Family Guy, the bar on that TV show, The Family Guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so he opened a bar and kind of just a brand new, tiny little bar, but brand new. And um, we were hanging out one night, and he said to me, he, I, I think uh, he overheard myself and another friend talking about how we'd always wanted to do stand up. We love stand up. We didn't know there was nowhere to do it in mainland China. I mean, Hong Kong you could with Jamie, but we didn't have anything. He's talking about and, Jamie uh, Gong Takeout Comedy. Exactly, yeah, with Jamie Gong from Takeout Comedy Club. And um, so where I was, that's a two-hour flight from Hong Kong, you know, it's not. Mm. So there was, we couldn't do anything, and then he overheard us, and he said, hey, if you guys agree to do a set, to do stand-up, I'll build a stage for you, <laughs> oh. and you'll commit to a date to do it, and I'll put in lights. And we were like, you know, we'd had too many, too much to drink, and we're like, yeah, sure, sounds good. <laughs> and then we forgot about it. And then the next day, he called me at like noon, and yeah. he goes, hey, the speech is in. You guys are set for December 17th, whatever the date was. I'm advertising, you're going on. <laughs> and so four or five of us, I think uh, four, maybe four of us, none of us had ever done stand-up before, were forced to put on this show and we didn't have any idea what we were doing. Like, we didn't have... The, like, when you guys started with Jamie, I'm, were you there at the very beginning? I was, yeah. I assume so, yeah. And so, at least, even if no one had done stand-up, I don't know if you guys had, but you had somebody, Jamie, who had some experience. That's of, right, yes. A light, how to MC, how much time to do. We didn't have anything. So we didn't even know that you were supposed to only do, like, 10-minute sets or whatever. We basically just let everyone go until they ran out of ideas. <laughs> On stage, so we had four comedians and maybe did like an hour and a half of, you know, our first time ever, we didn't know what we were doing. Good. Um, and, but it went great, I mean, it was a free show, it packed the bar, sold a ton of alcohol, and then Sean was like, yeah, when can we do it again? So we started doing it every month, a once a month thing, with no, so it was like a show once a month with no open mics or anything in between. That's bizarre. And, and it went well. Time. So we had to write like a new 10 minutes, whatever every month. Gosh. I mean, you're really just surviving on the fact that there was nothing else to do in town. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think you're going to hit the key point. I mean, being an expat in a country where there is nothing else of that kind of thing happening, it creates all kinds of opportunities. That's how I started doing juggling and unicycling shows in Singapore in 1994, because there was no one else in the whole country who had a unicycle. So if you do it, if you bought, you're automatically the best. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's just, uh, yeah, you're right. If you're automatically the best, there's nothing to compare it to. So, and if you've got masses of enthusiasm, you can get away with it for a while, can't you? You can, yeah. And it gives you this, like, confidence because everyone's excited to see you, even though you don't know what you're doing. But just coming back to New York, I see all these, I see people like starting comedy here in New York City. Yeah. And they're doing these open mics where you have to pay to get onto the open mics. So hard. And no one's watching, just yeah. the comedians, and everyone's bombing, and I'm like, I could never have done this. I needed that fake confidence. Yeah. You know? I don't know if you've seen a program called, on HBO called Crashing. If you check it out. Yes. Is, 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 is that pretty true? They show there? Well, I've only seen the first episode. But what I know, because I don't have HBO, there you go. but um, what I know about it is if, when I'm, you're walking around, people mention it to me all the time now, because actually where I do my sets is right in that neighborhood. Yeah, well, basically, show. it's just a guy 
going like you described, going to open mics. There's late at really, you get some put on really really late. He has to pay to go there. No one, there's no audience members. There's just a few other comedians who aren't listening. So very very hard. It's brutal. Yeah, I did. I, I never paid. I, I drew the line of paying. I'm like mm. I'm not gonna pay to come. Well, he, he the guy in the guy in crushing has to like give out flyers or get ten guests to arrive for for he's allowed on stage. That yeah, kind of stuff. Sometimes they do that. Yeah, they're called bringer shows. You have to bring other people. Yeah. But um, when I first got here, I did a couple, a few of those open mics, maybe like three. Mm. And sometimes it's like three in the afternoon on a Tuesday. So like, literally no <laughs> one's there. Except for people without jobs, you know? And uh, it's really depressing. Like I did two or three and I was just like, this isn't helpful to my comedy. This is actually, it's so depressing that it, it mentally it's bad for you. I, I, and so I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to do shows I can get booked on, and luckily that picked up pretty quick. And so now I'm just doing shows around town. Yeah. But... One of the point of my podcast is to give tips to people who want to somehow be on stage, become a, some kind of entertainer. And the, this, is a, this, this is our bizarre tip that we've come up with, and, uh, and it's actually true. What you do is you go to another country where nothing else is happening on the other side of the world, and you start it yourself. And 100%. it works. <laughs> It's, it a, bit, for all it's a bit extreme, but yeah, I've been doing it for 25 years now. <laughs> yeah. It worked, right? It's, yeah. It's, I think it's totally the way to do it because everyone. You get like, so much I, stage I, time. Oh, you have unlimited stage time. Especially when you start the open mic, you can book yourself as many times as you want. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never did. I think the first year I did comedy, I went down and did uh, the Takeout Comedy Club with Jamie once, and that was the only spot that someone else booked me on the entire year. Everything yeah. else was whatever I booked for myself. Yeah. And then I would say even within my first three years, maybe 5% of my shows were booked by someone else, and mm. 95% was I created the show, I produced it, and then host, or put it on, you know? So compare yourself, and, yeah, so you can compare yourself to someone who's been trying to make it in New York. You get you've had quite a head start because you've done so many shows, um, yeah. in 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 Asia, and if you if you hit it something at the right time, there can be a mini boom. There, there has been a mini boom in comedy in Asia, so yeah, so it's perfect. It's a great start. And at every level, I felt like Jamie Gong started was that two thousand seven when you yeah two thousand seven yeah. Okay, and then we started basically 2010, the very end of 2009. I think Umar in Singapore started at the same time we did. Mm. And then unbeknownst to all of us, there was just ever, all these places around Asia were starting. And so then, like the last couple of years I was there, I got to go out and headline as a headliner around Asia when I'd been doing comedy for like five or six years. But it's because all of us had been, there, there wasn't hardly, I mean, outside of you, there wasn't a lot of people who'd been doing comedy a really long time. Well, I, I haven't, I'm, my, I'm not really a stand-up comedian. I, I, I came from the um, late 1980s juggling boom. There was a sure. slight, there was, yeah, so I, I'm more of a juggler and unicyclist, but yes. Okay, but I've seen you do stand-up yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and so then, even... And everyone I knew who was kind of on the same circuit I was, bouncing around Asia, headlining, we were all like five or six years into comedy, which is just impossible in America. They're not going to let you do 45 minutes to headline a show Yeah. if you're kind of at the level we were at. But it, it helped all of it. It made us all better. On the other hand, um, the drawback is um, I don't think you can very, it's not very easy to actually make a living um, in Asia uh, because there's not much money involved. There's not. I mean, I, I, yeah, you kind of top out, you hit the ceiling pretty quick, and then you're right, there's not, you can make, you have to go somewhere else to make Yeah, it. so I've talked to people like Vivek, um, he makes about 50% yeah. from something talking on stage, and 50% from his computer website business okay. stuff. And he probably does better than most people, because yeah. he's doing cruise, you know, he does cruise ships sometimes. And also, um, Vivek can speak um, Cantonese, which in Hong yes. Kong... If you're going to be if you're going to be a, a stand-up comedian, and you only speak English, you're only going to get shows for like like three percent of the of the population. Exactly. So even him, yeah, he yeah. can only make fifty percent from from performing. That. Yeah. So it's tough. Can we go on a quick tour around uh, around the region? So there's the Kung, Kung Fu Comedy Club in China. Is is that one that you set up? Yep. So that's what our little show at the Drunken Clam. Eventually, um, about a year later, this guy Andy Curtin in Shanghai, yeah. which was about 50 miles from where I was in Suzhou, 
he started he almost did the exact same thing that I did. They found he, I didn't know him. Yeah. He found a bar with a couple friends, uh, guys like Joe Schaefer, um, Audrey Murray, some people who still do it, and they started the exact same thing. And then relatively quickly, someone put the two of us together because yeah. they were, whoa, you stand up and you do stand up, and no one else in mainland China, you should meet. And so then we. He was calling his Kung Fu comedy, so we kind of merged, and everything became Kung Fu comedy. All right. And when when you when you went on, you started going on your your mini tours around Asia. What was the next What was the next city you went to? Was it Hong Kong Takeout Comedy? Hong Kong Takeout Comedy, and then Andy and I would started setting up rooms. First of all, we were just doing it around China. We yeah. would set up. We'd find bars and ta- you know expat towns around China or towns that had expats where they we'd go to a bar and go hey do you want to do a show once a month or once every couple months and they go yeah sure okay let's let's, so, let's do specifics then because again this is for for people who want to somehow begin so you actually went okay. to a bar and you'd approach the bar and you'd say can we do a show at your bar exactly we would say. Um, and actually, I can tell you, this is the way you can do the same thing in New York, too, or mm. anywhere in the United States, probably in the UK. What, what was your technique, Ben? What did you do? We would do. We would map out. We, before we'd get there, we'd research all the, the bars in the town. Yeah. Um, we'd look, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's a good business expense, say, huh? When you're doing yeah. your taxes, all these, all these bottles of beer, oh yeah, that's business. That's business expense. Exactly, yeah. And we knew we were going to do an English language show, so we tried to find what the expat bars were mm. in the town. And um, we wanted a bar that was already popular, so that if we put posters up in their bar, a lot of people would see it. Yeah. You know, if it's like a dive, empty dive bar, then they're not going to help you promote at all. Mm. They don't have the clientele. So we'd find a bar that was already full, and then ideally we'd find a bar that had a back room or like a, a party room yes. or a side room. Yes. So that way you could run the show in the side room and they wouldn't have to close the main bar. That's a good idea. Yeah. I was always a big sticking point because if you ever, it, so even if the um, owner of the bar was so excited about comedy, and yeah, let's do it, the minute you're, if you have to close down his bar, the minute you don't make as much in sales for him as he would have made on a regular night, uh, he doesn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Of course. So, side room, then it's just bonus money for them. Yeah. And so that was basically it. And if we went there, it seemed like a popular bar. They had a side room. We would approach the owner and said, hey, um, you take, you sell all the drinks. We take the door or something like that. You know, we'll sell some tickets. We'll promote around town. And um, you want to do it. And they usually go, yeah, let's give it a shot. Mm. So you take the door so you can make some money. That's great. And yeah. how did, how did you, um, how did you, prove to the bar owner that you were bona fide real stand-up comedians? Did you show them DVDs well, or videos? No, they didn't care. They didn't, they uh, didn't care. They believed they you. They don't care. All they care about is how many people, how many drinks you're going to sell. That's them. true, yeah, yeah. They really aren't interested in, if it's good comedy, that's a bonus for them. Right. But they don't judge it off of how, I mean, this is just like the truth. It's kind of sad, I guess. But they just judge it off of, is this going to be, they think of it as, especially if they have a party room, they're trying to do anything to fill that room. Whether yeah. it's like a soccer team's end of year party, a football team's end of year party, mm. or a comp, or like a company's Christmas dinner or something. So if you're saying, we're going to fill that room once a month with 50 people or how many, 100 people, that's great for them. They go, mm. yeah, sure. And then, Especially if they don't have to take a risk. Like, we're not asking them to put any money No, down. okay, got it. Got it. It's a good business so idea. Us. Yeah, if we take all the risk and we say, you just sell the drinks to whoever we bring in, they go, yeah, sure. And was there any particular way um, you managed to bring people in? You're going to a, a, a city you, that you don't live in normally, work in. So how, yeah. how, do you, how do you sell yourself to... Well, it was always tough. Um, it was always really tough at the beginning. What would happen is... We really relied on the bar owner for the first show mm. because we tried to find somebody who was understood what stand-up comedy was. So hopefully, like either a foreign owner or an owner who had a concept of stand-up comedy. So yeah. that way, they could all week, all month leading up to it, they could tell all their guests about it. We'd have flyers on all the tables in the bar mm. all the time, posters up. And they'd be selling tickets at the bar. Mm. So bar owners like that. They like to sell the tickets because it means people had to come into their bar at some point to buy a ticket. Yeah. 
So when they were in two weeks in advance, they might also get dinner or get a drink or something. You know, yeah. so they always wanted to be the ticket sellers. And then we hopefully would go to a city where we 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 knew some people, even if it's like five or ten people, people who were excited and who could bring all their friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you can do one, the first one was always the hardest because we were also going into towns where we were char- the price we were charging was much higher than they were used to paying for anything. Yeah. <laughs> Because they were in towns that had had live entertainment at a high quality, you yeah. know, so they might be used to going to see, like, their entertainment might be like an open mic music night that's free, Yeah. and friend goes and plays Wonderwall or something, you Yeah. Know? but not like a Palo Gata coming to your town, and we have to charge $20. Palo Gata is a stand-up comedian who often comes to Hong Kong and Asia and performs and sells out headlining. Exactly. He's probably one of the most popular comedians in the region, right? yeah. in the Asian region, from the United States. And so even if the first show, say we might get 20 people or something, for example, right? Mm-hmm. This happened, a, this would be regularly happened. The first time we're in town, you get 20 people, but then you have Paul Ogata, you put on the best show of all time. The next, all those 20 go tell everyone that it actually is worth $20. Oh, you had Paul Ogata just, sometimes at the first show. Yeah, I'm giving you as an example. An example, but yeah, yeah a good example, involved. yeah. Yeah, and then um, the show's going to be, or Ruben Paul or somebody, and then the show's going to be killer, and then the next time you'll see 80 people. Like, it would just boom up overnight, because oh, they'd be sitting fantastic. all month telling everyone about what they missed. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so, if the first one was good, which we would always make sure the first one was amazing, and then you would just, it would pop up. And then we would always collect email addresses at every single show. So, ah. we do that giving out free tickets to the next show, and we just start building a database. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of did it. We never really paid for advertising. Oh, we would also try to get the local magazines to interview the comedian in advance, mm. you know, so get a, some kind of bump from local media if we could. And they were usually happy to do it because, as we established, there wasn't much going on. That's great. I mean, I mean, it sounds so, so, so obvious, put a lot of hard work into it, but it, it's not easy. I remember... When I first came to Hong Kong and I started doing the stand-up comedy, uh, takeout comedy, because I'm a professional entertainer, I thought, oh, well, why don't I see if I can get some shows for myself in, in bars? Didn't get yeah. anything. <laughs> I didn't. Oh, did, really? <laughs> not really, no. Well, I didn't, but now different. listening to it, if I'd done it something like you'd done, then it might have been good. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, good idea. Well, yeah, we were never asking the bar to pay us. That was, mm. I think that's what made it easier. See, the, the thing was, is, yeah. I wasn't really a stand-up comedian, so I, I but I had a I had a corporate um, juggling juggling and unicycle show, which I did for which I did for adults at corporate events. So I thought if I can scale that down and, and, and doing uh, doing a bar, I can do a half-hour one-man show and it'd be awesome. But it was yeah. it just I just couldn't sell it to them. I I showed them a DVD and, and that never really happened for me. Oh okay. <laughs> but, you, but you're always great. I, I like what you did. It, make, it makes sense. Well, yeah, if you can do one and you can show that you fill the room, they'd be like, yeah, go yeah, back. Yeah, brilliant. But That's also, true. I think Hong Kong, from what I've talked to, the guys, uh, people like Jamie Gong and Michael Dorsher, who mm. also run shows there, and other people, is they say that it's more difficult for mainland China because there's not as many bars that have back rooms or side rooms. That's true, there's yeah. There's more space in mainland China. Oh. So it's pretty common for bars to have party rooms and stuff. That's a good point, yeah, because in Hong Kong it's so cramped that there's no space for a party room, there's just enough space for a bar, so where are you going to put a stage for a show? Yeah. Yeah, that's what a lot of the local Hong Kong comics have told me that. Ah, good point. Okay, um, Comedy Club Asia Singapore and I guess Comedy Masala, you must have gone there a few times. Somehow I've never gone to Masala. Really? Oh. But it's just not on purpose, just on, like, just scheduling hasn't, okay. hasn't happened, you know. But I did do Comedy Club Asia with, um, excuse me, with Jonathan Atherton, mm. those guys. Yeah. Who's a comedian. And um, that was great. I did, let's see, I did their room in Singapore, mm-hmm. which was in, like, the old, um, the Parliament, the House of Parliament, I believe. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and that was really cool because you look like you're going in. You feel like you're going into some like government. Like, it looks like a state capital, like an American state capital. And then you go in, and it's like this comedy club. Um, that was fantastic. And then I went up to on the same thing 
to Malaysia and did the Crack House, that club up there. Crack House Comedy Club, Malaysia, KL, yeah, Kuala yeah. Lumpur, yeah. Um, in Kuala Lumpur, and then I went back down to Singapore, and we did this, this is very interesting, a, um, as part of the same trip, they had me do a British country club in Singapore. Ah. Uh. So, it was like a tennis club or something, you know? I, I, I lived so in Singapore for 12 years, do you know the name of the club? Oh man, I don't. Don't worry, uh, don't worry. But it was out of the city a little bit. Yeah. Kind of up in some hills. Mm -hmm. If that, if there were hills, maybe. Um, but it was. I've never done comedy in England, but I feel like I basically did that night. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. They were older. It was like an older country club crowd. Mm. Ball bridge. But felt very colonial. I was excited. MGM Macau. Is that through takeout? That was. Yeah, we got to. Um, I got third, kind of the first big thing I got was I got third place one year in the Hong Kong Festival. Yay. Yeah! In 2012. Yeah. And so that was my first, I guess, break, as you would call it. And um, because I got third, the top three, we got to go the next night to Macau. Yeah. And Rupe Paul was hosting that. Yeah. That festival. And so then we got to go. He's a Los Angeles comedian, super funny. And so then we got to go with Ruben and open for him in Macau the next night. Mm. And I'm not sure if you've done that, but I've, I've done I've done MGM Macau, yeah. It's great, right? I mean, like the show is okay. It's kind of a hard room, but you just feel like you're a superstar because they give you a hotel room. I know. And you get like this buffet dinner, you know. Yeah, that's that's the, that, that's one of the things about our business. Sometimes you say these things, and people go, "My goodness, that's amazing! You went to MGM Macau." But actually, yeah. it's it's a it's a relatively small space in, in the MGM, and it's basically set up for a band. Exactly. And the audience, yeah. there's, and there's quite a big space. So I guess it might be just a dance floor before before you get before the um you get to the audience. So there's quite a big gap from the stage to the audience. Yeah. So it's not that it's and not they, that easy. No, it's not as glamorous <laughs> as it sounds. No. For, all, the other part of it's great, but the actual show is hard work. Yeah. Yeah. And even then, you're right. There's that big space, and then there's these like couches. Where the front row is these big fluffy couches. Oh, that's right. Like, remember, I never like when an audience is like, I feel like they're too comfortable. <laughs> and they almost sit back with this, they sit back in the couch almost like a king and queen, like, oh, inter entertain me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> not easy at all. And they don't pay to get in, it's, it's free for them. And so uh, it can be a little difficult. But we had a good time. That was with Rishi Burani, I think, was. Uh, oh, he's he good. Won the he won the competition that year, and we've been friends since. And actually, I still I tour with Ruben Paul now um, around uh, in the U.S. sometimes, and um, still very close with him. So we met at, through that Jamie's festival. Yeah, and just rounding off, we got um, Stand Up Seoul and uh, 50th Street in Myanmar. I guess you've been to those places. Yeah. I have. Yeah, um, Seoul, Korea is great. Uh, I've I've gone. Oh, well, I've gone once, but I think I'm going to go back later this year. And there's a couple, just a Canadian guy and an American guy who are doing the same thing that all of us are doing. They started, they got there, there was no comedy, so they started a comedy room, and now they do a little tour. Um, one of those shows is really interesting. It's right off of, I think the town's called Osan, and okay. it's it's right out, it's a comedy club right outside of a U.S. military base. Oh. And it's crazy because the U.S. military all hangs out there because it's right outside yeah so it's like their bar street you know but then they have this curfew they have a 1 a.m curfew oh but no one else I mean, like the city doesn't the city is yeah. part of korea but the military does so then at one at like 12 30 at night all this u.s um military police yeah come onto the street and there's all they're just walking through the streets kind of monitoring while the Korean police are out on the street too, because it's kind of like this rowdy. There's like bar fights and everything because it's off the base, <laughs> you know. And these two different independent police forces just walking through the streets. Wow. And then at one o'clock, they everybody like at twelve thirty, you're hanging out and all these with the military people, and then they're pretty serious about it. They get arrested. They get put in jail if they're out past one. Okay. And so they're serious. They get out of there, and. At one o'clock, the, they do this sweep. The police do this sweep through the town, just looking for people to take them into prison. Will they come into the comedy club and will they go in? Will they, they go, go in the, 
Wow. So I was with these two comedians. We went into a McDonald's at like one one in the morning, and about one ten, they came into the McDonald's, looked everywhere, opened the door to the bathroom, like yeah. really caked the entire. It's kind of creepy, you know. But you got a white face. Didn't they think that you were a U.S. soldier? That's what I was worried about. Yeah, but then they didn't, which then was even more offensive because I'm like, what? I don't work out enough. <laughs> <laughs> a little too skinny. One of the guys is like this big, tall, like kind of chubbier guy. Another guy had a big beard. And yeah. so just, I think they didn't stop. They looked at us for a minute and then just like kept going. I think they just assumed we weren't. They, they knew you weren't. Um, but yeah, that was crazy. And um, business-wise, because I love, I love doing stuff that, um, that, that people can relate to, um, trying to make a career out of it. Business-wise, how on earth did you pay for all the plane flights traveling from country to country in the Asian region to do these do these shows? Oh, so the plane flights are included mm. in the... So I would get paid plus flight. Yeah, but you wouldn't get yeah. paid much. and You couldn't make a living doing that. Can, you can't, can you? No, it's basically like free trips, the flights included, the hotels included, yeah. and then you get paid to do the show. Yeah. And, I mean, you make some money. You can actually live... Like, I was living in China, mm. but not just, it was based off of all the comedy. The last, like, year I was there, I was living just off of comedy, but that included all these tours, because in Kung Fu Comedy, much like Jamie Gong, um, it's a uh, takeout, we do monthly headliner tours. Mm. Yes. Where we bring people out, and they tour around, and so I, that was part, I was involved in that business Yeah. as well. And so the income from that, plus my touring income, um, added up to I can make a living, but I can make a living. Of course, because you you were just um, making money from performing as yourself. You were also making money by running running a club and having headliners come in. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would go out and host the tours. Andy Curtin and I would trade off hosting, but we were also the producers. We were selling all the tickets, you know. Mm. And so yeah, we kind of made money both ways. Um, and so then that all added up to being able to live. As a comedian, but only live in China. It's because it was less expensive to live in China. If I would have moved, that salary wouldn't have, I couldn't have lived in the United States. Okay, forgive me here. I'm much older than you, so my memory sometimes goes. Have we discussed why you left China and moved back to? I think we did. You moved back to US. Uh, briefly, we did. It was because the government took away my ice cream. That was it. That was it. That was it. Yeah. That was the one. I thought we had. Um, it was that, and I mean the other part was that um, really like. Uh, my, I got married recently. We got married nine months. Yay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And we both wanted to, we were kind of, my wife's Chinese, but we were, she had lived in the United States before. And we had always kind of talked about it, wanting to move back. And, um, and then also comedy was at a point where I just felt like if I wanted to try to do it professionally, I had to go. Yeah. It was a time, to go, you know? And I would say I've definitely, it's definitely helped my comedy because it's just, the good thing about starting in Asia and doing it out there is that, as we were saying earlier, you get all that stage time to develop. But then at a certain point, the competition of being here in New York helps you kind of refine it all. Mm. Say, well, that one thing worked because I was in Asia, or but when you put it up against real competition, I need to add a lot more jokes to that. Or Yeah, because in a way, it, it's quite easy to get on stage in... Well, it was even, it, even five years ago, it was very, very easy to get on stage in, in Asia yep. and do a set, but in New York, much, much harder. Yeah, but it was it was the perfect time to go because I was good enough to where I didn't have to come here and do the open mics like mm. on that show, Crashing. I could just... So, yeah, you do... So, what are, what, are, what are bar shows? So, you've moved on to bar shows and um, actually getting booked. What, what are bar shows in, in New York? Okay, yeah, so bar a bar show is kind of exactly what... Andy and I were setting up around Asia. Ah. And what people will do, comedians in New York, if they want to run a show, they might say, I want to host a show every, win every once a week or once a month. And there's, 15, I think, 15 to 20 clubs, maybe 15 clubs in New York, mm. which is a lot, but there's thousands of comedians. Um, I've heard estimates of 10,000 comedians wow. in New York City. God. And so it's all these people trying to get on stage wherever they can, and yeah. not everyone can perform at all all of the clubs all the time. Yeah. You know? And so then bars, 
will have a back room, and for extra money for them, they'll say, okay, you can run the show here. Okay, got it. Monday. And what's happened is some of those bars have almost turned into clubs. They'll have shows seven nights a week, two wow. shows a night, with different comedians. I run Tuesdays at 7 p.m., and the next guys, I run Tuesdays at 9 p.m., and then, you know, however that goes. So there's endless amount of those in New York City. So you can bounce around and perform at all those, um, and then you can also do the clubs and stuff. And I apologize if I've already, or if I've already asked this, but um, getting booked and getting paid can you make some money? In New York City, you can make a little money, um, but not a lot of money. Not a lot of money, so yeah. So, it's maybe like, like I think if you get booked at the best clubs on the weekend, you'll get like $75 for a 10-minute spot. Yeah. And that's about what it tops out at. Yeah. A lot of the bar shows are free shows, even for the audience, and so then you don't get paid for those. Mm. The free... Or you might. They might do like donations and you get like 10 bucks or something, you know. But essentially what you're doing is putting your act together. The, the point of being in New York is to put your whole act together to try to go on the road and then perform on the road. And that's where you would make money. When you're doing a weekend in Minneapolis, you know, four shows or something like that. Ah, so it's to get on the road. That, that's the goal. That's the yeah, but it's a kind of a couple step process. What you want to first do, you need to be good enough to where when you go on the road, you do well. Mm, you know? Yeah. So that's in New York. I would consider it like comedy festival, twelve months a year. Meaning that there's all these comedians here. There's shows every night. Everyone's yeah. out. I might do um, like on Friday night. I did three shows. God, amazing. Saturday, I went up to Connecticut and did a show, which is an hour and a half away. And then I actually had an option to race back and do a midnight show in New York, which I ended up not doing. Just um, to jump just, in here, I love to ask people about traveling because um, people who don't do entertainment of any kind, for they don't know how much time we spend uh, traveling. What, what's so your, much. What's your favorite way of traveling? Do you have a, uh, do you drive your own car? I love trains. Trains? Uh, if I can do it, I will do trains. Also buses out here are pretty good because it's like Wi-Fi, they have Wi-Fi, they have bathrooms on the bus, wow. and it's super cheap. Um, and so if I'm paying, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to a comedy show and they're not including, they, they're paying me, but they're not including a flight or whatever it is, you know, I'll mm. go, if I can do a bus four hours to D.C. or something, Washington, D.C., I'll just do that. Um, and then trains are great, too, if, okay. if that's me. Like, I took a train up to Connecticut and came back. Yeah, just for your information, um... Singapore, for me, taxis were the best. Hong Kong, for me, trains are the best. Yeah? Yeah. Where um, do you train around Hong Kong? Oh, you mean subways? Yeah, the, uh, the, they call it the MTR, the subway, yeah. The MTR, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, um, well, I've lost my thought now. So, for me, um, I would, if, say I'm doing birthday parties, which is something completely different um, to, to what you do, I might have three or four around Hong Kong in one day. And for me, often the most stressful thing is trying to get to the next show on time. Do you ever have those those issues? Yeah, totally. And I'll have to map it out. One thing that's good here is that the people who are pr producing the shows understand that in New York everyone's doing a bunch of shows. And so a lot of times I'll be, I'll have like I've done this before where I've had two I'm on two shows at eight o'clock. <laughs> two eight shows. But I'll say one to one of them, I'll say I have to go up first, so put me on at 8.15. And the other one, I'll say I have to go on last, so put me on at 9.15. Yeah. And so I'll go on from 8.15 to 8.30, and then race across town and go on from 9.15 to 9.30. Nice, it's insane. But it's, it's quite good fun, isn't it, when you just make it just in time? It Ooh. is, and you get into this rhythm, and it's been, it, like by the third or fourth show, you're so loose mm. because you're just you're not even you're not nervous. There's nothing nervous about exactly. it. Exactly. So that you can create all of my new material comes from like the fourth show of a night when I'm on a midnight show somewhere, and just whatever's in my head I'm talking about. But do you ever have the problem when you do a lot of different shows in different places that you can't remember whether this spur of the moment thing you've actually said? Um, just two minutes ago on that stage or whether you said it <laughs> half an hour ago on another stage. I have that problem sometimes. I can't remember. Do you get that? Is that happen with your performance? That happens artists? sometimes, yeah. I, I can't remember um, whether, whether this thing I, whether I've done this 
in this show already or whether I did it in another show like an hour ago. Totally, yeah. So sometimes I find I have to stick to my script when I'm doing a lot of shows in one day. Totally, yeah. And I mean, for me, they're like 10 minute sets or something. And so like typically that does it's not as bad. But when that happens is there's been a couple times when I'll headline and I'll do two headline, two shows in one night. Yeah. And on the second show that happens, you're like, wait, did I already do this? Yeah, you can't especially remember. Especially if you tell a joke and then it doesn't get the reaction, the immediate, like that you're thinking it should, the immediate instinct is like, wait, I must, did I just tell you this? <laughs> and minutes ago, is everyone staring at me like I'm a maniac? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um, yeah, say, say you are, um, say you've, uh, you're saying something and it doesn't get a reaction. Uh, let's talk about some technical stuff. How do you deal with a, with a crowd who's not laughing? I try to stay as in the moment as possible. Yeah. So give them a. I try to give them, and I've kind of just learned that from doing it a lot. But give them a genuine reaction to whatever they gave me. Yeah. So that doesn't mean I'm not like mad. I never call them idiots or anything. But I might just be like, oh yeah, I guess that one's not funny, you know. And then just keep going. Yeah. Or I feel like tensing up. Everyone can feel that. Mm. The audience can feel it. Mm. Tense, um, or just try to. I just try to stay loose. That's really it, and yeah. just stay present. Yeah, and, it, and like I said, it is quite. It is easier to stay loose if you're doing two or three shows in one day and you're rushing around from place to place. You haven't got time to to worry about exactly. getting on stage. Yeah, you're not sitting there ruminating on like, oh, I'm on in 40 minutes, I'm on in 30 minutes, 20 minutes. You're just not even thinking about it. What about um, putting on new material? Because I find um, if I'm doing something new and I wander off script to stay in the moment, then I can't remember my new material anymore. Do you ever have those kind of issues? Yeah, um, that happens. Or I'll go into something new. Like I was, I was trying, I specifically wanted to work on this bit last night and I got halfway into it and something happened in the audience exactly and I, I went to that yeah. whatever happens yeah. and then I totally lost I I forgot that I was supposed to be working on this bit and I went into another bit exactly. and when I came off stage I looked down at my notes and I was like oh man I forgot to do that yeah but I guess as long as the audience doesn't know, it doesn't matter. The worst thing is if you, if you yourself stumble and go, oh, hang on, what was the new bit I was going to say? And you yeah, say, if you say that out loud, it kills the whole moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as I can stay away from that. But it is, it's, uh, yeah, with the new bit, I tried to just throw it in the middle of the set somewhere and plow, whatever, plow through it, you know. If it works, it works. Yeah. And... So yeah, I agree. I think I, I think um, if anybody's listening, I think that's a good tip. If you're doing new material, try not to veer off and do some crowd work in the middle of your new material because you just you just forget your new material. <laughs> yeah, and you won't um, like present it as you wrote it. Yeah, you know. So if you do crowd work in the middle of it, they might forget the premise, and then you can't actually tell if it's working or not. Mm. Oh, you might forget to tell it how you wrote it. How do you how do you write material? Do you have any particular techniques? I don't write in the sense of like actually a pen writing down. Mm. I will do that maybe after the fact. Um, once the, the bit's completely finished, I'll listen to it and go back and essentially like dictate it. You know, mm. um, is that the word when you listen to something and then write it down? I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> I question my own English. At this point. So you record um, you record your 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 your, your set, and then you listen back yes. to the, the new material. And you, you, the recording is a dictation exercise for you. You're writing down what you were saying, the funny bits. Exactly. So what I'll do is, um, with new material, I'll, I kind of will pace around my apartment by myself. Mm. Just I'll have the idea, and I'll just turn on my record, my voice recorder, and just riff it out. Just start saying it as a bit, as just saying it, saying it, oh. and trying to see like, well, what am I not talking about? Just let my brain go like dead, you know, essentially, and just talk. And then at some point I'll listen back to that and go like, okay, well that was funny. Maybe I'll pick out three bullet points that were funny and then try that on stage. Okay, that's interesting. So yeah, you'll be in your apartment and you're just walking around with an audio recorder, just spouting lots of stuff and then you listen like back crazy and, and see if there's yeah. any gold, gold nuggets of comedy in there. Exactly, yeah, but it's based on a topic. I'll have the topic in mind already. Yeah. And then um, if it's, if it, I'll take the two or three bullet points, go try it on stage, record that. I record every set I do. Is your on-stage persona the same as your off-stage persona? 
Um, I think so. It's uh, maybe a little more amplified. Yeah. I'm a little more um, energetic on mm-hmm. stage. I find that's only developed since I've been in New York because New York audiences, they're just like, they can be jaded. They've just seen everything, you know? Mm. So I had to ramp up. Like, you have to get them. You have to get their attention. You have to take hold, you know? Ah, yeah. So there's no time to go up there and kind of be shy or meek or, you know, at least for me, I found that my, I can deliver my material the best when I'm just super loose Yeah. and just like, ah, hey, what's going on, you know? Um, but yeah, it's a version of me. It's, Do you uh, make any costume choices, clothing choices? I try to just be, I, I guess yes, uh, but it's just to be as plain as possible. No <laughs> logos, no anything, because I want them focusing on what I'm saying, not what I'm wearing, you know. Yeah. And so I'll just wear like a college shirt and jeans or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, look at online, you've got an amazing website, so if people want to check you out, turnersparks.com, right? Yeah, turnersparks like it sounds, T-U-R-N-E-R-S-P-A-R-K-S. Yeah. And yeah. so we've got your website, turnersparks.com. Um, you do podcast, your own podcast, Lost in America. Yep, lostinamericapod.com. And if anybody else wants to check you out online, is there, are there any other key, key things? Are you big on... Uh, Turner B. Sparks, B, like boy, B. Sparks on Twitter. Okay. At Turner B. Sparks, and then that's about it. Another thing that no, it's a nice thing to cover, any, any tips that you would give to people? New in comedy? Yeah. 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 Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do it So, thank you, Turner Sparks. I sound really professional. Are there any yes. tips that you would give to people starting out on this crazy business of ours? <laughs> I would say use that voice at all times. That's right, yeah. <laughs> no, I would, yeah, I mean, it's like basic, but really it's just um, whenever you have, here's a specific one. It's just whenever you have a new bit, mm. deliver it like it's the best bit in the world. Yeah. I think I see a lot of younger comedians when they try out something new, it fails the first time because they're not confident in it. Yeah. And, and you can almost tell. You'll see how they deliver their best bits. Mm. And I, I'm sure I used to do this too. Like their their best bits, they deliver with all this bravado and confidence. And then the minute something new comes up, sometimes they'll even say they're like, "Oh, this is new," or "Oh, that was a new bit," or you know. If you step into it, mm. once you do that, you're not giving it a chance to work. But yeah. if you step into it the same way you would step into all of your best material, then you give it, it might fall flat on its face and bomb, but at least you can tell if that was good or not. Yeah, so don't deliver your new material meekly, like, is this okay? Deliver exactly. it, as, deliver it just mission. boom out, yeah. Yeah, boom it out, tell them that it's the best bit that's ever happened. Well, and then you'll, not, and then you'll know, then you'll be able to find out if it, if it does work or not. Exactly, it's a little more scary because if, if it bombs, it'll bomb hard. But whatever, you know, that's what you want to know anyway. You shouldn't be afraid. Don't be afraid of bombing, I think, is the next thing I would say, because that's the only way you learn. Mm. Yeah. How, do you, swing the- how do you memorize new material? I don't memorize. I just kind of, I'll write down bullet points, mm. um, two or three bullet points, like words that might remind me of what I'm doing, and almost just try to tell, like I tell a story yeah. that you know. Like, imagine whatever your story is, um, like the story I just told you about my mom. Yeah. I know that, or I told you earlier, I guess, about my mom. I tell, you, I know that it's a story. <laughs> I like that. That's clever, that. That's clever how you, you know, remembered. I, mean, I might put your mom's story at the start. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, I'm a podcasting veteran. I know. Woo! <laughs> but just like how you, um, any story that any, anyone has, think of your funniest story that you tell your friends, you know, mm. at a at night or at a dinner you're not memorizing that word for word you just know the story yeah so i try to approach stand-up in the same way yeah 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 i agree sometimes you write things down and when you read it out it's not as funny as if you just um if if you're speaking you know what's what's working that doesn't make sense but yeah yeah yeah. i mean and i'm not really i'm not like a one-liner guy Mm. Like sometimes one-liner comedians, it basically is memorized, you know. That's true, yeah. Because if you're doing one-liners, it's almost like poetry. Every word is carefully yes. put into the sentence in a special way, so you have to say it word for word in the right way. It's almost like a magic exactly. spell. Which yeah. seems impossible to me. I'm not that good of a writer. I can never do that. But if I can just tell it as I know it, then it seems to work better. All right. Uh, and then I would say the last thing is, if you ever have a bad set. Get on stage, um, 
get on stage again as soon as possible after that. Because right. I feel like people new at comedy, they, they quit when they have a bad set, and then they just sit and like think about it for two weeks, and it gets worse and worse and worse in their brain. But if you can get up the next night or even the next week or whatever your town is, you know how quickly you can get up, you'll forget about that set if you can just go to another one. So true. You only remember the last set. You only remember the last show you did. You don't remember exactly. the show two weeks ago. You remember the one you did yesterday. Yeah. And Brilliant. That's it, man. Make sure you're having fun. If you have fun, the crowd will have fun. That's it. Turn sparks. Brilliant, man. Great to talk to Thank you. Thank you very much, man. Real pleasure. Alrighty, that's Turn of Sparks. Thanks for listening. And before we go, a big shout out to Max Hampston, who wrote in about doing risky stunts in front of young kids at birthday parties. He reckons it's not the kids copying us who we should worry about. It's the ancient old dads trying to do the tricky stunts and injuring their bodies. Thanks, Max. Take care. Talk to you all next week.